So what I'm going to be talking about really is this idea that most of what was written about being a CEO is fundamentally out of date. The most successful CEOs we see right now are the ones that retired. They were brought up in a different time, like a classic is Bob Iger at, at Disney. So many years into the job and his leadership has evolved over the years. And you look at him now versus 20 years ago, so he's a different CEO. And I think what a lot of literature around this hasn't kept pace with what the modern world needs. So a lot of what I'll look at is what does it mean to be a modern CEO these days? How do you understand what the challenges are that you're facing? Hello, my name is Mr. Joe Leach. I'm speaking um, at the conference in October and I'm very excited about it. I started out as a user experience, user research consultant in about 2005. I worked with some of the big folks like eBay um, early on. I led the redesign of the train line, which is the UK train ticketing website in 2010. And then my biggest um, project I probably ever worked on was the redesign of Marriott.com in 2014. Across a huge host of countries and languages, uh, huge billions of dollars go through that site every year. And that was full research from researching across, I think we were researching about 20 countries, um, to a full redesign and relaunch of the whole online booking platform, which was very exciting and a lot of fun. I then worked with startups for a little while, um, involved in product and product strategy ultimately. Then I moved from there into working with CEOs. The reason I did that is my background and what was dispersed amongst that background was I studied neuroscience at university, so psychology and cognitive psychology. And I've also got a master's in human computer interaction or communication theory really. So it's how computers communicate with each other and how humans communicate with each other. And both of those things have really given me a fascination as well as my background in user experience into, into humans and how humans make decisions and choices. And one of the things I was always fascinated about and wanted to learn more about and where I followed my curiosity to was working with CEOs. Why do they make the decisions and choices that they do? Are they operating from the best places? If not, can I help them operate from the best places? And that's really what I do now. So I work with CEOs from early stage startup, um, typically venture backed, through to scale up, through to exit. So I also run a mastermind group for exiting founders who are about to exit their business. And I also work with founders post to exit to help understand what, what's next for them, as well as working with CEOs of larger enterprises too. So I kind of work across the world of CEOs, both in tech and non-tech. And really my drive behind that is an innate curiosity for how humans work and how decisions and choices are made. And my support and my skills are brought to bear on that to really help CEOs make better choices and decisions. A lot's been written on this and my book is different. It's 10 years old this year. So a lot's been written around the kind of dark arts. There's the world around nudge and um, that work that was done really to help people to hooked, you know, all these books around getting people using and almost addicted to the technology you're working on. That's never the place that I came from, obviously, because it's not the strongest and most ethical place if you're designing um, products for people. Where I come from is really, and this is also something I bring into my into my coaching, is, is this, this the concept of, I suppose, radical transparency, really where you are totally honest with your customers about what you're doing and you've got a shared goal together. So a lot of the psychology I work around is understanding really what is it that people are trying to do and then I help them get there as a coach but then also the work that I used to do as a user experience consultant was making sure that you supported them getting them there. People are trying to buy a new kitchen, how can you get them there? If people are trying to book a train ticket, how can you get them there? If people are trying to book a hotel room, how can you get them there? If people are trying to sell their business for a billion dollars, how do you get them there? All the work that I do is supporting people towards a goal. And once you understand that goal and you work backwards from that goal, the steps are fairly easy. And my secret insight really is to work backwards from a goal. So if somewhere you want to get to, envisage that goal, what does that goal feel like? What does that goal look like in terms of design? And you work back, what are the steps backwards? We always tend to work forwards to that and that's harder. Working backwards is often a lot easier for you to get there. Um, and that's been my tip for working not only with design but also working with people as well. The 
biggest notices and things that I've seen are decisions that are, everybody likes to think they make objective decisions. That decisions are driven by the evidence and the data and all of those sorts of things. But the reality is, is, sub, is decision making is inherently subjective. We bring a lot of our emotions, a lot of our experiences to making decisions, and that's true across the organisation. And we can't help but do that. So a lot of the work that I do is understanding the motivations, the emotions that sit beneath decision making. And understanding those, taming those, talking to those, looking at those emotions, you can make better choices and better decisions. The worst decisions come from a place of fear, where you're reacting to something that somebody else has done. You're reacting because you're worried that this this thing's going to go away. You want to stop business going to somebody else. Decisions when they're made from a bad place are often bad. I mean, you look at Twitter, you look at Elon Musk, historically a really good decision maker on the whole. If you look at SpaceX and Tesla, at Twitter, really poor decision making. And that's operating from a very different emotional place, a place of fear. Operating from somewhere where you've got strength, and you've got vision and you've got excitement, better choices are made. And so if you listen back to a lot of those podcasts, the commonality there is that people that make decisions from a good place make the better decisions. The people that make them from the bad place, well, hey, they don't make the better decisions. The simplest way of doing it is envisaging the end goal. What does that end goal look like, feel like, smell like? What does it, what's that feel like at the end of it? So a lot of what I do is get people to imagine themselves at the end goal. That goal is we want to be a billion dollar company, right? What does it feel like? Where do you, where you wake up? What meetings do you have? What do you do? What are you talking about? And envisaging yourself there is the first step to be, to, to be able to achieve that really. In feeling yourself there, you can understand what it's like to be there. You can understand the work that you need to do. And then simply once you're there and we've got you into that position where you know what it feels like to be in that, to be there, we turn around and we look backwards and say, well, what helped you get to the place that you wanted to get to? What were the steps that you made? What were the moves that you made that enabled you to get there? And again, it feels simpler when you look backwards and see the plan from behind. Also, I ask questions like, well, what's going to stop you getting there? What's going to get in your way? What are going to be the blockers or the challenges or the things that you're going to face along the way? What are your biggest fears across this? And we address all of those head on. Because again, one of the biggest reasons many people don't succeed is they are scared. They're going through a period of fear, often a lot of the time with the stuff they're working on. So they don't make the best choices and decisions at that point. And it may not even be something you're conscious of, but often understanding talking about these things can help you understand and overcome them. I talk about name it to tame it really. If you name it, you can tame it and overcome it as well. There's nothing wrong with dealing with emotions when it comes to decision making and being a leader. What is wrong is when you push those emotions down and try and not focus on them. That's when mistakes happen and when mistakes are made. So what I'm going to be talking about really is this idea that most of what was written about being a CEO is fundamentally out of date. The most successful CEOs we see right now are the ones that retired. They were brought up in a different time, like a classic is Bob Iger at, at Disney. So many years into the job and his leadership has evolved over the years. And you look at him now versus 20 years ago, he's a different CEO. And I think what a lot of literature around this hasn't kept pace with what the modern world needs. So a lot of what I'll look at is what does it mean to be a modern CEO these days? How do you understand what the challenges are that you're facing? Because again, you may think that they're just in your business. Of course, they're not. The societal as a whole. There's a bigger element of what you've got to deliver in terms of impact as a CEO. So CEOs are the modern equivalent of the of the old of the leaders of old, where they've got a lot of impact, a lot of power in that position. So a lot of what I work and think about is, well, how can you deliver that? How can you support, um, develop, um, empower your team all the way through? What does that look like to do that? How can you operate a business positively by moving forward? And a big part of what I do alongside that is making sure that this is fun. How can it be fun to be the leader in the position you're doing? How is this a challenge that's enjoyable, that doesn't stress you, that means that you keep pace with your work life, but you also keep pace with your family life? So a big part of it is around this concept of sustainability and impact. How can you have a life that you want to live, be happy, make sure your employees are happy, your customers are happy, and be super successful because of that? 
not at that cost, is the two things are things that go step step in step, hand in hand. Happy employees deliver results, deliver happy businesses. Happy customers are paying customers. They're happy to come back. If you embrace these principles all the way through, you can be and run a successful business. And that's really what the modern CEO is, is looking at the mindset and skill set to operate a business in the 2020s. And that's wholly different from the businesses of old. I've talked about fear a couple of times now. So fear is an interesting one. Is for you people to grow, really, you have to go through fear. So you have something called the comfort zone, where we all live, right? The comfort zone is the stuff that we are happy and comfortable with doing. Okay. Me, for a long time, I didn't like talking to cameras. I didn't like talking in front of people. It wasn't in my comfort zone. To get to the place where I wanted to be able to do that, I had to go through the fear zone. And then go through the fear zone. It's like a, like a rubber band that, that pulls you back. It can pull you back into the comfort zone. You know, you start making excuses. You start to question yourself. You start to am I imposter? Do I have imposter syndrome here? And it's perfectly natural to be going through this fear zone. But you go through the fear zone all the time when you make change. All right. That's part of the excitement of being a human. That's exhilarating going through that fear zone. But again, it can also be scary. And that, that rubber band can pull you back into the comfort zone. But equally, that other rubber band pulls the other way. And so you have to go through the learning zone, which is, is learning new skills, new ways of being, new tactics, new strategies to get through that fear zone. And then what happens is once you've learned those things, your comfort zone expands to take in these new challenges, these new concepts like speaking on stage, running a, a business of 200,000 people. What was once difficult and challenging becomes part of your comfort zone. But any, any ambitious person then looks for well, what's the next thing? And that's again on the other side of the fear. You have to go through the fear zone to expand and to go to the next thing along. And that's really how successful people operate, is they go through the fear zone and they know that growth is on the other side of that. And that it's a rubber band that can propel you through that or it can pull you back into the comfort zone throughout. So it's really truly understanding that you have to go through fear to grow. And that's a natural feeling to have. Approach it, talk to it, understand it. But once you get on the other side of that, oh my gosh, the possibilities are endless. What I, what I come across all the time with, with leaders is, is, in, is imposter syndrome. And imposter syndrome is often seen as being, it's called a syndrome, it's, it's, it's already got negative connotations to it. I always like to look at these things and help understand, well, is this a, is this a feature or is this a bug? And once you start seeing it in that way, you can start to understand how to react to these things differently. Similarly, leaders that I work with have ADHD. And again, similarly, is that a feature or is that a bug? These are both non-neurotypical approaches to running businesses. And they are very successful in the modern age to have both of these things. And so it's about understanding the fact that we're all different. And you might read those accounts from folks on LinkedIn about the hustle, about the grind, about how they've made millions and billions. And there are many ways that are successful and you can learn from those people who've been successful. But I always talk about there are as many ways to be successful as there are ways to fail. And so it doesn't have to be the same way for everybody. So a lot of the work that I work on is helping people understand that their own path through leadership, through the particular challenges that they have, be that challenges around imposter syndrome or ADHD or other things that are holding them back. These things are the very things that have been their strength behind before this. I work with a CEO of a 20,000 employee company who, who procrastinates and for a long time he's given himself grief about this and the reality is as you look at the reason he's procrastinating is the things that he isn't working on the stuff he's ignoring are actually the stuff he shouldn't be working on the very reason he has procrastination is he's able to prioritize the things that really need to be done and the things that are weighing down on him are stuff that he can actually hand off to other people so some of the most common common misconception i see around psychology and leadership is that emotion is bad that being different or non-neurotypical is bad. Being um, on the spectrum is bad. It's not. These are actually strengths that can drive really successful people to deliver incredible results in business and in, and in life if they're embraced.
Yes, a couple of things actually. I'm working on two, three things actually at the moment. The first one I'm working on is how to run a successful board of directors. I've come across many dysfunctional ones in my career and I do all the time. I am looking to speak to chairs, uh, non-executive directors, investors, VCs who sit on boards of directors. I want to know what works, what doesn't work, what advice can you give to CEOs, especially newly founder based CEOs who are new to running a board, how can they learn to be better at running a board of directors? Because again, it's all about shared responsibility. It's about tapping into the insights and experience of that board, not being, which it sometimes can be, seen as being a challenge or can be seen as locking horns with the other members of the board or something that's just a little bit gnarly when it doesn't need to be. So I'm looking for support and help with that. Any insights, drop me a line, I'd love to talk. That's number one, what else am I exploring? I am also working with, this is a this is a hey yo, and this is a hey yo is a big ask, so I don't expect everybody out there to help me. I'm looking for folks who are YouTube creators, who have built successful YouTube channels, have got a good audience, but are feeling a little bit overwhelmed by the weight of that success, that they don't quite know or have the skill set to embrace that success. How can they better leverage the stuff that they're good at, which is creating stuff that people love to watch um, and to not do the stuff that maybe perhaps weighs on their mind, like running a successful business that makes money and allows them to do the happy things that they want to do. So my big hey yo is any YouTube creators out there that you, you could introduce me to, tag me in a comment, everybody out there. I'd love to help folks who are needing some help. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing your how to web. So come along to how to web. I've got lots I love to talk about, but more importantly, I've got lots of great questions that I want to ask you guys as well. So I want some real insights from you about how you are running your businesses and what your challenges, excitements, visions are, what gets you up in the morning, what keeps you up at night. I want to know these things. So if you come and see me at the conference, just come and chat to me. I would love to learn all about you. Thanks very much and I'll see you in October. Bye.